few years ago. And, and it was God who changed and redeemed and remade my dad. I liked the new dad I had. I didn't like the drunken dad who walked in the front door and literally like a tree just flat on his face from drunkenness just out. I didn't like that dad. I, I was confused. It was a dark home. But God changed all of that. And that's, that's God in, in my father. It's Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of God, the hope of the world seeing that is that Christ is alive in you. Not that I'm a good guy. Not that I'm a Baptist or that, oh, well, I go to church and that makes... No, it's the glory of God. Christ in you. And, and so, so I said earlier there was uh, six things historically... The Gabe Lyons and his friend have said the church has done. I just kind of want to hit those high spots. This is not the main part, just a summary that I wanted to move to. And I want you to think about these. Here's some questions. If we're going to deal with seniors as well as other needs in the community, we have to ask some questions. Number one is context. And this is not a modern day thing. This is the way the church for 2,000 years has looked at the community. Number one, we start with context. Context is asking the question, how can we live the gospel in today's cultural context? It's asking, who are we? As a body of Christ, as a group of local believers, who are we? We're not just here to have services on Sunday and to conduct a few weddings and funerals along the way. Who are we? Jesus said we're salt and light. We need, that, we need to answer some questions about context. And I, again, each of these six could take 30 minutes apiece, and I'm just tossing them out there as a conversation piece as you evaluate how you're reaching seniors particularly. You can ask, what's the context of your community? How many senior adults are in your church as well as in your community? How many caregivers are out there, and how can we care for the caregivers? which is a big part of what we're talking about today. The second thing the church has dealt with is confession. Context is first, who we are, but then our confession. What, what is it that we're confessing, that we're proclaiming of God's gospel, of Christ's gospel to a world around us in darkness? What is our message? What, what are we trying to say? And again, don't try to say, look at us, we're good folks, or we're Baptists. We need to say, the gospel has changed me. Jesus died on the cross for me. Now, he wants to change you. He wants to come into your dark world. He wants to come where you're decaying and, and declining and stop that with the salt of his love. The third point is identity. The church has always evaluated our identity. And that's talking about how does God see me? And how does that help me see the needs of others? You see, we're, before we start looking at how we can care for others, we usually have to answer our own identity question. What, what am I all about? Sometimes that has to do with a giftedness. But folks, today it has to do with gender. People are confused about their identity. Who am I? I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm a man or a woman. I don't know anymore. There's, you see, that is a result of darkness. What, what happens in the darkness? I can't see my way. I don't know where I'm going. What is that I've touched here? What is this? I don't know. You just are ignorant of everything. And I say that just by saying not as a slam, but as a lack of knowledge. We don't know because everything's dark. And so identity even becomes a part of that darkness. I can't even see inside who I am. I don't know. We have to start asking that not only about ourselves as the body of Christ, but as a corporate body. Who are we? And I know we've done this so many times before this way, this ministry, but who are we going to be in this community? The, the fourth quality that you'll see in every church throughout history that's impacted this community is formation. 
Formation is a word that talks about our habits and our lifestyle. What are the habits? What is my lifestyle that is going to help or hurt my influence to others? What is it about me that is going to be a positive influence? What is it about my lifestyle that is going to be a negative influence? The formation of my spirituality is, is, is the word that we're talking about here. The fifth word is community. Community. How am I invested in the church community and how can our church community make an impact on the secular community? We're different communities. And, and they know that. Sometimes we don't realize that because we're in the light. They don't know it because they're in the dark and they're looking like, oh, those weird people over there. They're strange. They're odd. And then when they meet us, they're like, hey, you're normal, aren't you? And they're shocked. But our community needs to be invested in their community and personal relationships, and that's what it's talking about. And the sixth is vocation. Everyone in the body of Christ talking about what our calling is and how God wants to use that. Everybody's not the preacher. Everybody's not the music person, but there are many that are scientists, that are accountants, there are teachers, they are administrators, they are gifted in so many different ways, and God wants to use every one of those. Uh, there, there are so many things we could say about all of this, but let me just be personal and sort of wrap this up. I'm, I'm talking here this morning about, as a church, how can we look at ways to care, ways to be what God wants us to be to change our influence in the senior community. And I've shown you that we have to start evaluating who we are and what our assignment is and what God has called us to be and what Jesus said we are in salt and light so we can glorify him. Let me just personalize this from a, my own experience. Uh, my wife's parents are with the Lord now. Um, they were church planters in well, wherever they went. They vocationally, Pam's father was a, an electronic engineer on ships. He designed ships in Virginia, Newport News. He also lived in Tampa and worked at the shipyard there. But wherever they went, they got involved in planting churches. They planted several, helped start several in Newport News. They went to Tampa, did some there. We went on mission trips together. Um, Pam's mom was a, a real hoot about a lot of things. She was not the negative picture of the mother-in-law that a lot of people joke about. She was a blessing to me. Um, but one of the things she always said was, I'm never getting on an airplane. Never. You'll never see me on an airplane. She was just scared of airplanes. Oof. One day she called me a number of years ago and said, I know what you're going to say, but our church is doing a mission trip in Korea and I'm going. I said, you know there's not a fast boat to Korea. <laughs> she said, I'm going to fly. I'm going to fly. And she said, and we need some other pastors to go and help us. And they asked me to ask you. I said, I wouldn't dare miss it. I want to be on the plane with you for your first flight. <laughs> so she was an overseas missionary. I mean, these were, these were great folks. In um, 2003, do you remember the Atlantic storm, Hurricane Isabel? It was the worst disaster of 2003 uh, in the Atlantic basin here. Uh, Isabel started moving in on their home in Virginia. Pam's mom had cancer uh, and was in treatment for that, and her dad had uh, lung issues, and they needed electricity. And we said, you've got to get out of there. And with all the arguing about, no, we'll be fine, we finally drug them out, and we moved them to our home in Boone in mid-September mid -September of 2003. <clears throat> she never went home to her earthly home. That was mid-September. On Thanksgiving Day, she died in Boone. For mid-September to the end of November, 
we were caregivers for her parents in our home in a, in a situation that we never anticipated. Uh, Isabel drove them out of their home and they moved into ours and we thought this would be a two week visit, but oh no, she was in and out of the hospital in Boone. She died there. Um, a lot of things changed in our lives and the body, and, and what I want to say is I was a pastor of a church. But a lot of people in that church, not just because I was a pastor, but because they were loving people, made a big difference in our caregiving experience. I still had things to keep doing. My wife uh, had already uh, quit her job. She was an artist. Uh, she, she worked for Samaritan's Purse. She designed a lot of the materials you got from Samaritan's Purse. It's in print. She's a graphic designer. And she had already quit that, so we were fine as far as her time, but it still, it changes things, folks. I can tell you as a caregiver, and I know Beth Harris is talking about this and others of you are talking about this because you've been there too in different environments, um, but it does change things and I, I can't tell you how much. In fact, my wife was going to be here today, but she had a chemo treatment on Friday. She has stage four cancer herself and for five years she's been in chemo and I've been moving into a caregiver role for five years with her that I never thought I would have. But she's pretty independent and she gets up and goes a lot, so I'm not, and she's not bedridden. But I remember those days when her parents lived with us for even that short period of time, how that what blessed us was people in our church calling and saying, I know your mom's in the hospital, but can I take your dad uh, down to Chick-fil-A and just have lunch with him? Sure, he'd love that. Just get out of the house, do something. But it was, it was the church, it was the body of Christ that cared. They, they look, you know, caring is just a part of who we are. It's part of being salt and light, that Jesus changed us and made us into people who are not to be self-focused and self-centered, but to look at the needs of others and invest in whatever way we can. They cared. And it was a privilege for us um, but it was a challenge. It was different. It's been a privilege for me for these five years and however many more God allows uh, with my wife. But again, uh, it's, it's not quite the same. She's not bedridden. I still do my work. I still stay on the go. And, and yet it does adjust things a little bit. But where people get involved, it shines a light into our routine that is unbelievably bright and very much appreciated, very, very much. So I understand that. And I want to encourage you to find those ways. I want to encourage you with a closing verse that Paul closed out the 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians with. And the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is the classic chapter on the resurrection. And it's all about what the resurrection's about. And Paul goes on and on and on, and then he closes with this verse. Therefore, this is verse 58. 57 verses he's talked about something, and now he summarizes it with therefore, which is the preacher's way of saying finally. <laughs> therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't forget that. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I could tell you, if I had the time, personal stories of when I thought I did my worst in ministry or in something in life and found out years later how God used it to be an influencer, or even a salvation experience for someone. And I'm like, seriously? God used that? Yeah. That's why we're to be steadfast. Don't look at, well, I'm not doing as well, or I'm not as gifted, or I don't think we can help. Or, don't look at it. Finally, brothers and sisters, be steadfast. That means stay on target, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that this work you're doing is not in vain. God gets glory out of it. Let me just uh, have a prayer and close my segment, and then, um, uh, Sam, are you going to 
lead us into a break or something? Okay. Father, I want to say thank you for the grace that you've given to me, that the grace you've given to your New Testament church, to everyone in this room and to all who have said yes. I repent of sin and I follow Christ as my Savior. That you jumped in from there and kept our life from going even farther downhill in decay. And you injected the visibility of light like we have never known before. You've enlightened truth. You've enlightened our identity, our world. Everything has come to light because of who you are and how you have chosen by grace to love us when we were not worthy of it. I pray we would apply the same thing to the world around us now. And that we would be willing to look not at someone's physical condition or even how they might have verbally abused us or criticized the church or whatever, but that we would just love them in their aging days in this earth and let them see the glory of God through your New Testament church and all of us as believers. Thank you for the ministry of NC BAM and for Sandy and those who lead this. I pray your blessing on them and that you would just, just expand their work. It's so much needed in, across this state and so much a, a blessing wherever they're able to uh, invest in, in their ministry. So much a blessing. Thank you, Lord. And I pray you would just broaden their horizons, expand their borders, and continue to use them. And everyone in this room, Father, I pray we would commit ourselves in a fresh way to abound in your work, knowing that what we're doing for your glory is never, never, never in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Winston-Salem. And uh, I've gotten to know Beth and Mark, her husband, the pastor at First Baptist Church in Charlotte, and uh, they are a wonderful couple. And so we welcome Beth. Beth led one of our breakout sessions this morning. Some of you heard her earlier. And so let's give a warm welcome to Beth Harris. Can y'all hear me? I do an after school program at our church with children and we need to get their attention. We always say if you can hear me clap once, but I think by your yeah, I think by your reaction you can hear me. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. I feel very blessed to be able to share. I'm going to share a lot of my personal story. And hopefully through that, touch on some ways that we can support the family caregiver. Um, my in-laws actually did both have various forms of dementia, but my mother did as well. And that is going to be the journey that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, my choices of how we can support the family caregiver may sound a little bit unusual at first, but I think by the time I finish, they will make sense. They are broad, and they will also include a few specifics. So what I want us to think about today is in the journey of life in general, in the journey of caregiving specifically, what are the gifts that God has given us to be able to not only survive that experience, but come out of it better for his glory. And so I've chosen three of those gifts that I want to share with you today, and I've given them some little descriptions. So the first gift I call the grace-filled gift, and that's the gift of laughter. The second gift I call the necessary gift, and that is the gift of of truth and that's where we'll dwell for most of the uh, presentation and then the final gift is the greatest gift and that is the gift of love well in the year 2001 fall of 2001 i was living in augusta georgia my husband mark was the pastor of curtis baptist church in downtown augusta 
my parents were both still living, Bill and Betty Bates, and they lived in Hendersonville, North Carolina, where they were active members of First Baptist Church Hendersonville, the church where I came to faith in Christ at age 18, a wonderful church that discipled me so well. I just can't say enough about that. In 2001, we had been noticing for probably close to a year that my mother was changing. Her personality in particular was becoming more withdrawn. And someone who had been funny, she was always reserved in public, but at home, funny, I mean a razor sharp wit, was now very flat in her affect. Someone who was beautiful and loved pretty clothes, could sew clothes, loved to sew things for the home, was now wearing the same dirty blue shirt and the same dirty blue jacket almost every day unless she was coaxed out of that. She was getting lost driving to activities that she did often, one of which was tennis. One of the things I really admire about my mother, she taught school for 30 years. When she retired, she immediately launched into two activities she had been dying to get into, and that was writing and tennis. She took lessons. She got certified. She played in tournaments. So she was active as a senior adult. She got lost driving to tennis. She had to go to a gas station and call my dad because there was a one block detour one block and she could not figure that out well fortunately uh, in many ways she had some type of neurological episode we still don't know exactly what happened because medically at the hospital they could not figure it out but my father thought she was having a stroke so he took her to the ER that led to a referral to a neurologist that led to a referral to a neuropsychologist and at that time we got a diagnosis that she was nearing the end of early stage Alzheimer's disease and on the border of the moderate stage. As the psychologist explained it to us and I had actually gone there, uh, I told the breakout session because my dad was the world's sunniest, rosiest, most optimistic human. And I felt that I would not get the realistic story unless I got it myself from the doctor. So my husband and I had gone. She had gone through about three hours of testing. We came in. We got this diagnosis. She was very much aware of the diagnosis. And she was actually very much aware that something was wrong with her. And that was part of the reason for withdrawing. Um, she knew she wasn't keeping up in conversation. She was having to write everything down. If she, if she put the biscuits in at 12 and they were supposed to come out at 1210, she had to write that down. Take the biscuits out at 1210. She would write herself notes where her pocketbook was in the house all kinds of coping mechanisms, but she was coping so well, none of us knew that she was that deeply into the disease until she went through the extensive testing, um, thanks to that referral, and we got that news. So I was living four hours away. I have children in elementary school and middle school. I am 38 years old when my mother got her diagnosis. She was... Um, progressing fairly rapidly despite getting on medications and in 2004 she had her first episode of forgetting who I was and that was at my kitchen table I'll never ever forget this day they had come down to Augusta she and my dad to visit with us see our kids I think it was probably somebody's 13th birthday and she <laughs> looked at me across the breakfast table and she just said do you remember when your parents sent you to live with us, but you didn't want to do anything I said? And I just looked at my dad. And that probably was true that I didn't want to do anything she said, but I really didn't know what to do. And my dad just started laughing. And you know what? That was okay. That was the right thing to do. Some of these situations with Alzheimer's, they're so heartbreaking, they're so odd, they're so bizarre, they're so strange. 
when you're not the person dealing with it every day, and even when you are, it feels weird. I just heard somebody say, oh, how awful. Well, in a way, it was awful. She was already forgetting who I was. But in another way, we knew this was coming. We knew this was going to happen. And so as I look back on that moment, that was really comforting to me to look across, see my dad. He gave me a wink. He gave me a chuckle. And it was like he was saying, you know what? We're going to get through this. It's going to be all right. This kind of stuff's going to happen, but it's going to be okay. Well, as time progressed, um, she stayed pretty much on an even kill. And then in 2007, <coughs> my father passed away, and he was actually the one of the two of them that had more, uh, seemingly more health problems. So his death was not completely unexpected, although um, he'd had a leg amputated due to diabetes, and we thought he was coming out of it. He was in rehab, and we were going undergoing a long, arduous journey of all the three kids trying to juggle our time between Hendersonville and our homes. By this time, thankfully, we were living in Charlotte, so we're not four hours away. We're about two hours away, uh, trying to take care and manage everything. Mom would go back to Charlotte and stay with me, or I would try to take her to the hospital. He was in rehab. He was getting better. They were about to go into assisted living together. And on Monday, he was supposed to be released from rehab, and they were going to go straight over and move in. He and I had been over. We had done all the arrangements. Sunday morning, 6 a.m., the phone rang. We found your father dead in the bed. Well, this was a problem. We had not anticipated this happening this quickly. Um, but we immediately just made, made plans that mom would be with us ongoing. Um, we, would, we would look into facility care, which we did. In fact, briefly, we tried her in a facility in Charlotte, and I was so unhappy with that situation at that point that Mark looked at me and said, go and get your mom. I know that's what you want to do and just bring her to the house. So that's what I did. <laughs> um, so she moved in with us and then stayed with us until August of 2010, until her disease was becoming so difficult to manage at home that she went into a memory care facility. But uh, what I want to share with you um, as far as that gift of laughter and a sweetness that can come. And again, hopefully, if, if for no nothing else, to help you be a little more at ease when you are talking to people dealing with this disease. When mom was diagnosed, I went back to Augusta, Curtis Baptist Church, where I taught uh, school at the, at the church school. And I was coming out of the elevator, and another teacher was coming in. We stopped and chatted briefly. And she had heard about my mom's diagnosis. She was at the end of that journey with her husband's mother. And she looked at me and she said something, I want you to leave here and I want you to take this sentence and I want you to repeat it whenever you need to to anybody and you can tell them that I told you. She looked at me and she said, there's something sweet in every stage if you will look for it. There's something sweet in every stage if you will look for it. And that proved to be so true. And I want to tell you a story about how God did a sweet thing with laughter and how that helped me to gain perspective on what was a pretty high-stress uh, day with our family. Well, Mom is living with us. I still have children living at home. So on a particular Wednesday, my youngest child was 15. He had his driver's permit say no more about stress. Mark couldn't even ride in the car with our kids. I had to do it all. He couldn't take it. We're driving. Now, and keep in mind, we're driving in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you've ever driven there, I know we're not Catholic, but we're coming into Uptown. Now, my youngest child is a clone of my husband in every way. He is now the high school pastor at Parkwood Baptist in Gastonia. He is great, but sometimes he really just acts and, and thinks later, or he just panics. I don't know how to describe it. We call Mark George Banks around the house because of his panicking sometimes. So 
my youngest is driving and he's 15 and I'm in the passenger seat. Now in the back seat are my two children older than him. My middle child is a boy named John. He is uh, very smart, very book smart. And at this particular moment, he was obsessed with Pirates of the Caribbean. So he had this pirate voice that he would talk in all the time. And he would sometimes call himself Captain. And one time we asked him, I asked him in the car, I said, what's the captain's first name? And he never missed a beat. He said, the. <laughs> so we would call him the captain, and he would just say these things in that, you know, Jeffrey Rush, the character on Pirates of the Caribbean, the captain, he would say these comments. So he's in the back. My daughter's in the back seat. I think this was at the end of her first year of college. And my daughter is a very typical firstborn girl. She's organized. She's driven. She's going to keep the family straight. She's going to keep those boys straight. She shared a bathroom with them. That's all. one of the few times I remember her being a teenager coming out in tears. And she said, Mom, you've got to make them clean up the bathroom. I can't live like this anymore. So that's my daughter. And then sandwiched between those two is my mom with dementia. And we're all driving to be super spiritual, wonderful pastor's family at prayer meeting. So we're getting into downtown Charlotte, and we have to make a right turn. Well, our light is green, and you would think of us going straight or turning, but the light is green. Now, what my son did not process is if my light is green, that means there is also a walk signal for a pedestrian coming parallel to me. So I'm seeing this man is jogging. And he's about to enter this intersection where we're going to turn right. And I was about to say, hit the brakes, when Matthew decided the best thing to do was hit the gas as hard as he could and beat the pedestrian through the intersection. So there we go. We're making this hard right turn. I screamed. The man was in the crosswalk. He was entering as we're going. My daughter screamed. Pirate blurts out, Ah, you nearly bashed his brains in. <laughs> and I had just had enough. And I was just about to yell at all three of them. If you're a mom, you've been there. Don't act like you're too spiritual. You know you have. So I'm about to just say something I'm going to unleash. And suddenly, in the back seat, I hear this laughing. And it is my mom. And she was just laughing her head off at this. She thought this was the funniest thing that she had experienced. And it was so neat in, a, in that moment, uh, kind of what God did with that. Because when I heard her start laughing... It was like I went from this to just down to this. You know, it's okay. He did not run over that pedestrian. You know, he is a good kid. He is just 15, and he doesn't know how to drive yet. You know, my smart alecky pirate, he's not a bad kid either. He's all right. He's just at that age where he thinks that's funny. And my daughter, she had already begun to lecture Matthew that just is what it is. She's just trying to help. She's not been a mom. She didn't understand that's not helping. That's stressing me out. And so at that moment, I was able to stop, and I was actually able to be or have a more Christ-like response to my own children in that situation because of that gift of laughter that God gave me through my mom. So what I want to share about that today is just, I think there's a perspective that comes when we can laugh. Um, uh, this is the go-to verse, but Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. It is easy to have sorrow of heart when you have a loved one on the long goodbye of 10 plus years of decline with dementia. But in the midst of that, 
it's okay to be merry sometimes. And if you're like me, sometimes when I'm with Mark in a situation where maybe someone's in a hospital, 